June 17, 1865. A very warm day. Some of our cattle are gone. They are hunting them. The girls have gone up on the mountains to look for flowers. After dinner, Anne, Mary, Mrs. Carey, and I took a walk up on the mountains. Frank was up there getting wood. Mrs. Kirkland stayed at the wagon with her little boy. He is not well yet. I never expected to see such sights in my life. We went up on one about 200 feet high and looked down on the tall cedars in the valley. Mary and I started up to a cedar tree on the top of one, but the wind blew so hard we could not climb. We got wood to last some time. I was so tired when we got down, I thought I could not get to camp. We met Frank coming after us. He thought the Indians had taken us. We got to camp about sundown. They had just got in with the cattle. Boone County, Missouri, where Ruth Galloway Shackelford was born and raised, is in the indigenous territories of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Osage, and Oseti Sakowin. I'm Jen Globius, and this is the Halanaki Deep Dive, a podcast about the process of mapping and analysis for historical and archaeological research using open source tools. In this episode, I'll discuss Ruth Galloway Shackelford her life and major life events, as well as attempt to put her diaries in context of Lillian Schlissel's book, Women's Diaries of the Westward Journey. Let's dive in. Ruth Galloway was born on July 31st, 1834, in Columbia Township of Boone County, Missouri. She was the sixth of seven children born to Samuel and Rebecca Galloway. Her mother, Rebecca McCalla Galloway, was born in Scott County, Kentucky, while her father, Samuel Galloway, was born in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania, close to the border of Maryland. But he had moved to Scott County, Kentucky by 1810. Samuel served as a private during the War of 1812 in Captain Redding's company with Rebecca's father, Lieutenant Joseph McCalla. Samuel and Rebecca married in 1817 in Scott County, Kentucky, and there they had their first four children before moving to Boone County, Missouri around 1825. They arrived in Boone County five years after after the county had been established, and only four years after Missouri had become a state in 1821. Most white colonists in Boone County had arrived there from Kentucky and Tennessee, like the county's namesake, Daniel Boone, while later colonists to Boone County would also arrive directly from Virginia, like the Shackelfords. The Galloways settled in Columbia Township, which already had a hospital by 1822, and within the decade would have a newspaper and a theater. The 1830 census reveals that the Galloway family was composed of seven people. Samuel, who was between the ages of 40 and 50, Rebecca, whose age was between 20 and 30 years. They also had two sons and three daughters of various ages. Ruth was born in 1834 and was only three years old on December 6, 1837, when her father, Samuel Galloway, passed away. The 1840 census lists Rebecca Galloway as the head of the household, with four sons and three daughters still living in that household. That same year, Ruth's older sister, Mary, married William Carson, a farmer, and settled nearby within Columbia Township. In 1846, another older sister, Nancy, married William Carpenter, who was also a farmer and who also lived in Columbia Township. By the 1840s, Columbia and Boone County were both booming. Columbia College, which later became the University of Missouri, was founded in Columbia in 1839. The white population of Boone County in 1840 was 9,647 people, while the black population was 3,032 people, which made up almost a quarter of the total population of the county and only included 24 free black people. So out of 3,000, only 24 of those black people were free. The rest were enslaved. By 1845, an African colonization society which sought to send formerly enslaved people to Africa, had been established in Columbia. The population of Boone County had increased by just over 2,000 people by 1850. Most of them were white people, although the number of black people who had been enslaved had also increased slightly, while the number of free black people 
decreased from 24 to 13. Whether that decrease was from immigration to Africa, which is very unlikely, or more possibly the free black people moved elsewhere in North America, but we really don't know in any case. Also, according to the 1850 census, 1,924 families lived in Boone County, including the Galloways, with Rebecca Galloway still listed as the head of the household. This 1850 census was the first to list the members of household other than the head of the household, and the census also included information about place of birth of all the people, their professions, and value of real estate. So from this census, we have confirmation that Rebecca and her oldest son, Robert, who was age 30, had both been born in Kentucky, while the younger children, who were still in the household, had all been born in Missouri. Rebecca had real estate valued at $720, which was not the least amount for any family on her page of the census, but also was not near the top. It was relatively low for having property listed. Ruth, at this point in 1850, was 16 years old. Gold fever hit Boone County hard by 1850, and about 500 immigrants left for California from Boone County, which when you think about it, it was a population of just under 15,000. So 500 out of that is a fairly sizable amount. Among the immigrants who left Boone County for California in 1850 was a Robert Galloway, who might have been Ruth's oldest sibling, who was 30 years old, but we don't know this for sure. And if it was Ruth's brother who went to California, he didn't stay long, since we have records that Robert Galloway married Jane Hall McRae in Callaway County, the next county over, in Missouri, on November 20th, 1851. In 1852, under the 1850 Act of Congress that granted land bounties to officers and soldiers of the United States, Rebecca Galloway was able to claim 80 acres of land due to being the widow of Samuel Galloway, who had served during the War of 1812. However, this land did not remain in the family, since on the land patent, Rebecca signed away the land to a man named Raleigh Asbury. And while we don't know why she signed the land away, it may have, may have been to pay off a debt or to have for cash, so extra money for the family. Two years after that, on October 24, 1854, at age 20, Ruth Galloway married William Franklin Shackelford in a ceremony officiated by Reverend N.H. Hall of the Presbyterian Church in Boone County. Ruth and Frank's first child, Sarah, was born a year and a half later in Boone County. But by the time of the 1860 census, Ruth and Frank were living in Shelbyville, in Shelby County, a little bit further north in Missouri, near Frank's older brother, Cumberland Morgan Shackelford. And I'll talk more about the Shackelfords in the next episode. Ruth and Frank had added two more daughters to their family by this time, Margie, age two, and Rebecca, age one. Meanwhile, in Boone County, by 1860, Ruth's mother, Rebecca, was no longer head of a household, but living with her daughter and son-in-law, the Carsons, along with her youngest son, John, who was just two years younger than Ruth and aged 23 at the time. In the same township, so Columbia Township, the Carpenters, who are also Rebecca's daughter and son-in-law, in addition to their own children, they also had Ruth's older sister, Jane, living with them. So that it looks like the household that Rebecca had held together for decades after Samuel passed away had broken up by 1860. Rebecca Galloway herself passed away in 1865 in Columbia, Missouri. She wasn't mentioned in Ruth's diaries at all. And I don't have a more secure date for when she passed away in 1865. And of course, you know about Ruth's travels in 1865 and 1868 to California and then back through Texas. In 1870, the year that Ruth died, her older brother Robert Galloway was still living in Columbia Township in Boone County, Missouri. He was working as a miller and without any real estate value listed on the census records. All of Ruth's siblings, except for her older brother, William Galloway, who went back to Kentucky, all of her other siblings ended up living the rest of their lives in Boone County, Missouri. In that way, most of Ruth's siblings and their families had the stability that Ruth seemed to crave as she wrote in her diary as they were traveling to California and back. 
Lillian Schleisel's Women's Diaries of the Westward Journey book was first published in 1982 and since has been re-released in 1992 and 2004, which is a testament to its popularity and usefulness yet today. Material for the book came from diaries, reminiscences, and letters from 103 women, all white women, uh, she does address Black women's journeys a little bit in the book, but acknowledges that the material is scarce for actually understanding westward journeys by Black women. And this is something, if you're interested in more, and if you haven't already listened to it, listen to episode seven of this podcast, Sweet Freedom's Plains, or read the book Sweet Freedom's Plains, which I'll put a link to the book in the show notes. Overall, in the book, she does a few things. Overall, Schlissel provides a narrative about changes to, the, to travel along the westward trails in the context of women's juries, of their diaries, of their entries. And she breaks it down into three stages. The early stage is 1841 to 1850, when the trails were first being established. There was little help for anyone if they ran into problems along the way. And so this is where you get bad disasters, the era when the Hastings cut off uh, caused problems and uh, the Donner Party that occurred during this period. And she also noticed, and this has been pointed out by others, that immigrants during this early stage were mostly those who had been moving from so-called free land to free land. So squatting on land, clearing it out, and then when the area around them started to, to settle up, they moved on to other free land. The next stage, the middle stage, was from 1851 to 1855. This is when the trails were more established. There were a few more places to go for help. The immigrants were also more established. And this is when wagon trains started including um, droves of livestock in, time, in places. And often the immigrants would stock their wagons with any implements they needed to run a business. But this is also the period when cholera, the cholera epidemic, was very rampant. And many people who traveled along the trails at this period, like, passed away. They died. The late stage, 1856 to 1867, so including when the Shacklefords traveled, was a period when the trails had been well established. Like, thousands of immigrants and their wagons had traveled along these trails by this point. There were many places along the trails for help and supplies, including stage lines and stage stations that ran on the same roads. The telegraph was along the entire trail by 1861, so it was another way to communicate with people. But there was also more indigenous hostility by this period, since there had been two decades of white travelers who had come up against indigenous peoples, worked to take their land, and also brought diseases with them. And so there was more hostility and more actual grounded fears for hostility from indigenous peoples. And so this late stage when the Shacklefords traveled was actually built upon these the earlier stages, like the roads that were established were deeply rutted by the time that the Shacklefords traveled in 1865. And so their traces from the graves of the earlier peoples, houses that had been left behind, all left traces that the Shacklefords could see and that roof um, wrote about in her diary. And this is another reason for having a, a deep map, like I described in the last episode, because with a deep map, it can include information from earlier travelers that is not directly when the Shacklefords were traveling, but those experiences were built upon by the time that the Shacklefords traveled on the same roads. So there's a series of themes that Lillian, Lillian Schlesel laid out about the difference in women's perspectives on the westward journey. So in these themes she writes about in her book, the first and perhaps the most important is that men made the decision to immigrate and women, because they were under the power of the men, often didn't have a say. This wasn't the case for all of them. Uh, she did document two single women who did travel by themselves. So they had made the decision to travel, but mostly the man of the household, either a father or a husband, made the decision, and then the women had to do it. 
And so they, there's a lot of reluctance in the diaries, um, but the women put in the work to keep their families together. And you see this with Ruth Shackelford's diary, that she was reluctant to leave. She wanted a home. She described all the homes. Were they shabby? Were they well-kept? And she also expressed longing for being back in Missouri, um, very, being very sad when they parted with her friends when they left in 1865, and just a longing for home in general. And you can tell there's a difference between Ruth and her family. Her family, except for that one older brother who went to Kentucky, they all, once they got to Boone County, that's where they settled and that's where they stayed. Another theme is that many women counted graves or noted graves along the road and noted them in their diaries. And this is something that Ruth also did. Any grave she came by, she would count how many. Were they recent? Were they old? Was there a name on it? And she would list the name. So this was definitely something she did. Another theme that emerged from the women's diaries that Schlesel found that little was usually written down about how to care for infants and small children. And she thought that this was probably information that was passed on by word of mouth instead of in writing, along with other so-called womenly concerns, such as menstruation, um, marriage, childbirth, and pregnancy. Those topics usually don't get mentioned in the women's diaries. Like, sometimes there would be a mention by a daughter of the family, oh, I have a new little sister today. And that would be like the first mention that her mother had been pregnant. And Ruth also mostly follows this. Um, she only mentions her little children when they're sick or there's an accident. So early on, little Frankie, um, in 1865, he'd had an accident falling out of the wagon and getting rolled over, but he was fine. There was a mention on May 5th, so right when they're starting out in 1865, that Anne Gatewood was nursing her baby. So there was a mention of how to take care of very young children. And the fact that they were traveling with a baby at that point is is remarkable. Another theme is that women tend to tended to socialize among themselves. They kept to themselves, they did all their work, they did their work in company with other women, but they were working with women. And you see this in the entry that I read at the very top of this episode, where the women, the children have gone for flowers, and the women go for a walk after dinner, and they gather wood. Earlier on, there's also an entry in right after they take off that Ruth was baking and cooking with Anne Gatewood. And then later she was working with Mrs. Mays. And after she became friends with her, Mrs. Kirkland, especially in 1868, she socializes with Mrs. Kirkland a lot. Other trends and data that came out of Lillian Schlossel's study is that the the age of a woman at her first marriage changed with when the woman immigrated on the Western Trail. So during that first stage, the women were younger. They usually got married between the ages of 13 and 18. So that's their age at their first marriage in the first wave. But after like 1852, when the immigrants are more settled and more established that are coming now, the women's ages at first marriage was between 20 and 31. And Ruth fits this in, fits in with us. She was actually 20 when she was married, so she follows that pattern exactly. Immigrant families also tended to still be growing, so they had more children yet to be born. And the average size of the families while they were immigrating was 3.4 children. But when completed, those families usually had an average of 6.3 children, so at least six children. And mostly Ruth and Frank Shackelford's family fits in with this. They had five children on the 1865 trip, so larger than the average size. And their youngest was only two. Women would get pregnant on the road somehow. They went through like childbirth and pregnancy without talking about it, but it was still happening. And they went through all of these things while traveling in wagons with no restrooms at regular places. Um, very little privacy along these roads. And especially if you've ever been through Nebraska, you know that it's the home of Arbor Day because there were no trees. There were very few trees. And so there was little privacy for women, except it, with the, the company of other women. 
Um, Another note, I think I mentioned this in an earlier episode. In 1867, Ada Jane was born, still while they were in California. She's not mentioned in the 1868 diary, even though she was less than a year old when they set out. So Ruth definitely did not mention or talk about the younger children unless something happened. The last thing I want to talk about with Schlissel's book is that at the end, she has a table with the information from the 103 women, their their diaries, their reminiscence, their letters that she looked at. And it's an interesting table. And at some point, I'm thinking about digitizing it and adding in information about the women that, well, Ruth Shackelford herself, and then also, if I can, some of the women that she traveled with, like Anne Gatewood and Mrs. Kirkland especially, who she was close enough with that we'd have a bit more information. Mapping update. All of the public land survey plats for Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah that I think will be useful have been georeferenced. So now I just need to georeference a few historical maps to fill a few holes. I'm having trouble finding a good source for maps for roads in Iowa in the 1860s. Most maps from that era show railroads, but not roads themselves. So I need to do a little bit more looking there. And then my next step after I have the entire route is digitize segments of the routes from the public land survey maps and other maps. And so that will be coming up. Now for a few endnotes. So here's the references for the information in this episode. So much of the information about the Galloways and Ruth and Frank Shackelford came from U.S. Census records, which I mostly found through FamilySearch.org, which is free, a freely available website through the Church of Latter-day Saints. In this episode, I also used the library version of Ancestry.com to search for records accessed at my local public library in Manchester, Connecticut. The search on Ancestry showed me Rebecca Galloway's 1852 land patent, which can be accessed through a search on the Bureau of Land Management General Land Office Records, and I'll put a link to the patent itself in the show notes if you want to look at it. That land patent gave me information about Samuel Galloway's military service during the War of 1812. I found that Samuel had been part of battles in Michigan Territory in the book Remember the Raisin, Kentucky and Kentuckians in the Battles and Massacre at Frenchtown, Michigan Territory in the War of 1812 by G. Glenn Clift, and I'll put a link to that book in the show notes as well. I also knew to look at census records for Scott County, Kentucky, through the ancestry search. And I was also able to find a transcription of the 1810 census records for Samuel Galloway and Joseph McCalla, Rebecca's father, at a website, which was copyrighted in 2001. It was for doing transcriptions of these um, census records for Kentucky. So it was copyrighted in 2001, but does not appear to be active any longer. But you can find the transcriptions that were done are still linked on that website, and I'll put a link in the show notes. I found the 1820 census record for Samuel Galloway in Scott County, Kentucky, through FamilySearch. And with that, I'll be updating records on FamilySearch with new information I found because I want to give back to the website that's been super helpful for me. A link for Frank and Ruth's family tree on Family Search is in the show notes, and that's where I'll be updating all this information. Information about Boone County, Missouri in the early 1800s came mostly from a book, History of Boone County, Missouri, published in 1882, and it's available for reading online on the Missouri Secretary of State Missouri Digital Heritage website. And of course, the link to that will be in the show notes. The Genealogical Society of Boone County and Central Missouri website was also super helpful because, among other things, it included indexes for books that contain marriage records and also wills for Boone County. And those indexes facilitated my search for those books online on Happy Trust. And I'll post links to all the books I used. So next time, I'm going to talk about William Franklin Shackelford and his family. Email questions or comments to deepdive at helenaki.com or ask them on the Helenaki Deep Dive Facebook page. 
Show notes with links to resources mentioned in this episode are available at helenaki.com. That's H-E-L-O-N-A-K-I dot com. You can also find ways to support the show, now including merch, such as t-shirts, mugs, and stickers with the Helenaki Deep Dive logo. And you can find those at helenaki.com slash support. My thanks to Patreon supporter at the geospatial analyst level, Leah Varel. Your support keeps the Helenaki Deep Dive going. The Helenaki Deep Dive is written and produced by me, Jen Globius of the Helenaki. The theme music is Deep Ocean Instrumental by Dan O of danosongs.com. Additional sounds from zapsplat.com. Thanks for listening.